And those watching online, as I've already welcomed those of you who are here in person. We've been doing the study of the life of David, and our ongoing joke is we haven't got to David yet. So today we're going to get to David, and I want you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. While you're turning there, let me remind you what we have talked about. We've talked about the fact that the era, the period of time known as the Judges, has kind of come to an end. Samuel is the last judge. Saul becomes the very first king of Israel. Certainly Israel sins against God by choosing a human king instead of God as their king. And Samuel reminds them of that almost on every occasion. Saul has a very great beginning. He has a beginning where he prophesies with the prophets. He, he, the scripture says that the spirit came upon him, that his heart was changed, that he was a new man. But he doesn't stay there very long. He gets pretty full of himself. He's got a problem with pride. He's got a problem with uh, uh, manipulation. He's got, a, he's got a problem with being selfish and wanting what he wants. And uh, he wants the accolades of the people. And he wants all the people to be talking about him. In the meantime, he is uh, disobedient to the Lord. And on uh, one of those occasions of disobedience, actually there's two of them recorded really, 1 Samuel 13 and 1 Samuel 15, and in those two combined, what Samuel tells him is, you've lost the kingdom. It's been torn away from you because of your heart, because of your disobedience. And I want you to find with me in 1 Samuel chapter 13, I want you to find verse 14. It's kind of the end of this one particular conversation. It ends up kind of ongoing in chapter 15 again. But because of Saul's disobedience, Samuel says to him, I'm in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. And so he's made a declaration that God's already decided, no, I'm not, I'm not going to stick with this guy. I have, uh, I've saved him, I've loved him, I've anointed him, I've blessed him, and he's turned away from me, and he's turned to walk away from me. And, and so the next phrase is underlined in my Bible. It's really, really a phrase that'll be remembered for uh, generations to come. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. David is going to become known uh, uh, to, to this very day, 3,000 years later, if, I, if you're any, any kind of a Bible student at all, and I would say to you, you know, in Jeopardy style, who is the, you know, a man after God's own heart? The answer is, who is David, right? I mean, uh, uh, Abraham is called the friend of God. Uh, Moses said he talked to God the way a, a friend talks to a friend. But David is the man after God's heart. Does he, does he trip and stumble along the way? Uh, oh yeah, he, he certainly does it. But what we can recognize even when he stumbles is when he gets up, he, he, he wants God. When he, when he sins and he repents, he wants to turn to God. When he wakes up in the morning, he wants God. His Psalms say this to us. We, we have this record of David that we don't have of Moses or Abraham because we have David's diary. David is a, he's a poet, he's a musician, he's a journal writer, and so we have his psalms, and he tells us when he's afraid, and he tells us when he's uh, running for his life, and he tells us when he doubts God, and then you know, we do this circle, but you'll discover this, this thing with the psalms. He'll, he'll start with how much he loves God, he'll tell God, these are my troubles, I'm really in big trouble, and he'll, he ends with how much he loves God. And so David is this man after God's own heart. I, I don't know about you. I, I want to be a man after God's own heart. I think, I think why, why would you come on a really cold, snowy Wednesday? Because you want to be a, a man or a woman after God's own heart. The problem with just everyday life that doesn't have any challenges or adversities or difficulties in it is that you can kind of start to think that you really are following God, that you're, you're desiring God, 
but you haven't tested that in a while. And so what does adversity do for us? It, it's that moment where we get to recognize, am I, am I really someone after God's own heart? It, it comes out when you face a problem. And the problem that we're going to talk about this morning that David faces has a name. It's a, it's a giant of a problem. And he has a name, and his name is Goliath. And so I want you to just flip with me over to uh, chapter uh, 17. First chapter 17, people who have never read the Bible know about David and Goliath. It's, uh, it's used by the sports pundits who, when the, when the little uh, Cinderella team doesn't, not supposed to be able to beat the big, really good team, they call it a David and Goliath story. That we, we use this term in all kinds of metaphorical ways, but I want you to know that in this particular story that we're about to read, Goliath is not a metaphor. <laughs> He is a man who is bigger than Shaquille O'Neal. And he is a warrior. And so, uh, so what I want to do this morning, and I'm going to write a little bit on the whiteboard behind me, is we're going to do this comparison. And the comparison is going to be what does, the, what does a man after God's own heart look like? And so here, that's going to be David, okay? But it's, it's someone after God's own heart. And then, and then what, what does the world look like? And sometimes the world's going to be uh, Saul. Sometimes it's going to be Goliath. Sometimes it's going to be the fearful armies. And we'll talk about this together as we just kind of take this chunk by chunk. Now, it's a long chapter, so we're not going to take the time to read the first part. Here's how the first part goes. Saul and the armies of Israel, they're on one uh, top of one hill over here. And then over on this hill are the Philistines. They're on top of this hill over here. And then right down in between them is a great big flat valley. And it was very, very common geography for where battles would take place. You wanted the high ground so that if they charged against you in your defensive positions, they had to come uphill. And this is true all the way through military history. But frequently when the battles would meet, and remember this is in the days, this is before artillery, this is before drones, this is before uh, uh, jets, this is before bazookas and tanks. This is in the days of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And we don't think about this very much anymore, but it was, it wasn't, there wasn't anything, no, there's nothing glorious about any battles or military war, but this is when everything was done with uh, swords and arrows and uh, uh, Spears, axes, uh, tomahawks. This is this is hand to hand, really ugly, bloody stuff. And you and you need to remember that the Greeks, several hundred years before this, had started doing this thing where sometimes instead of everybody dying on both sides and there being thousands and thousands of deaths, they would send out two champions. They would send out two champions and they would fight and, and, and then the, ideally what would happen is whoever, whoever lost would just submit to the others. Although you know how that goes. Everybody makes that deal and then as soon as your guy loses, you, you, you renege on it uh, all the time. And so that, that tradition out of Greece had come down into the Middle East. And on this occasion, the Philistines are using it as well. And so you've got the two armies, they're camped on the, the two hills. And every morning, Goliath would put on his armor. He's somewhere in the vicinity of nine foot tall, maybe nine foot, nine foot six. He's a, he's a ginormous man. He's, and he's not just tall and skinny like a basketball player. He's a big man. And the Bible talks about how much his, his armor weighs and how much his spear weighs and what he's got on it. And he would come out every morning and he would yell out at the Israelites and he would curse them and he would curse them by the name of their God. And he would say, why should we all fight? Why don't you just send out your best guy and we'll fight. And if we lose, we'll be your slaves. And if you lose, you be our slaves. Why are you afraid to fight? Are you pansies? Are you sissies? Come on. And he would say way worse things than that. I've just sanctified it for you. <laughs> uh, so here's what you have to know. 
On the morning that David arrives, David arrives, uh, David's gone back and forth on many occasions. Um, he's even done some things uh, when you, you, the problem with uh, f- uh, 1 Samuel uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 is the story gets, it's not all perfectly sequential. So he's gone back and forth. Uh, his, he's got three older brothers in the army. His dad wants to know how they're doing. So he finds the army, he comes again, and he brings them care package from mom, from home. And when Daniel arrives that morning, Goliath has walked out. He's cursing the Israelites by God's name. He's telling them, why are you afraid? Why don't you come out? And here's what you need to know. When David gets there, Goliath is making his challenge for the 81st time. So you read the story and you're like, hey, Goliath is just, he's, you know, he's challenged them to a fight two or three times. No, no. Every morning and every evening for 40 days. For 40 days, Saul has cowered in his tent. For 40 days, not a man has stepped up and said, I'll take him on. Not one guy. David shows up. Goliath walks out, gives his challenge it, by now, it's rehearsed. Everybody knows it. They know what he's going to say. He gives his challenge for the 81st time, and David's like, oh, boy, I can't wait to see who cuts this guy's head off. And then he's looking around. Who's going out? David, David's like, well, I'm sure this is the first time this happened. Nobody would let this guy talk this way twice. Nobody would let him defy the armies of the living God. We're going to read that phrase. Nobody would let him do that. Not among these guys. Who's, man, I can't wait to see who's going. How come nobody's going? And this conversation starts. So this is where we are in the process, okay? So here's how it goes. You've got 1 Samuel 17. Um, Find verse 23. We'll start in verse 23. So David's there. He's just arrived. And as he's talking with them, the behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and he spoke the same words as before. It's the 81st time and David heard him. It's the first time David's heard him. 81 times for Goliath, first time for David. Verse 24 says, All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and they were much afraid. Just flip back over. Look back in verse 11. This is the first time. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So what does the person of God look like that's different than the world? This person is faithful and this person is fearful. Now, I did not write about David that he was fearless. We tend to think that fearless is the opposite of fearful. It's not. Um, those that I have talked to, I've never been in battle. I have great, uh, we're just right here, we're right on the verge of Veterans Day when we remember those who have done so much for us. Um, as I've talked to those in battle, what I've discovered, what they've told me is that everybody's afraid. So it's not a matter of this one's afraid and this one's not afraid. Everybody's afraid. It's what you do with your fear. Some run toward the battle line and some run away from the battle line. But the, biblically speaking, the opposite of fear is faith. The Apostle Paul would say to Timothy, God doesn't give in you a spirit of fear. It's the key for me is not in myself. It's not that I somehow try to find bravery in myself. No, the key is that I find faith. And that I trust in the Lord. And so here's where this all starts. And this is, the, this is the beginning of two different paradigms. One who seeks the heart of God and one who's just being self-protective as well. And so 
So uh, all of this is going to go back and forth. And so verse 25, I'm back in verse 25. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that comes up? Surely he's come to defy Israel. And, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. And he'll give him his daughter. And he'll make his father's house free in Israel. So imagine this. If you go down and kill the guy, no more taxes. Now, when you read this, you should be asking yourself, why isn't Saul going down there to fight him? Saul's saying, oh, you can, you can, I'll make you rich and you can marry my daughter and you won't have any more taxes, but it's a really good question. How come not Saul? How, how come not the general, Abner? So, verse 26, David said to the men who stood by him, wait, 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 say that again? What? He says, oh, this is what's going to be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Do you, do you understand what David's saying there? David is not saying, I could whoop him. That's not his first response. Who defies God? It's a faith response. It's an understanding of who God is. So verse 28, Eliab comes in the scriptures. I, I, I hope Eliab's a better guy than this. We only know Eliab from two passages in scriptures. We know nothing else about him. We know that God did not choose him to be the next king. And we know this conversation right here. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard David when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Do you, do you hear the tone of his voice? Do you, you, you hear what he thinks of David? I know your presumption. I know the evil of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. And David said, as a true little brother, what have I done? I, I, I was just asking some questions. Just asked a question. And he's smart enough to turn away from his older brother to another and get some information from somebody else. So I want you to see something else here. I want you to see innocence. I think that's how you spell it. Versus uh, defensiveness. Eliab's got a defensive spirit. I, I, I don't know where it comes. Maybe it starts the day uh, that Samuel didn't choose him. Maybe he al already had it. Maybe he was just upset that David, the baby of the family, it was spoiled. But David shows up and Eliab doesn't like him. He doesn't like the fact that he's there. He tries to put him down about what his job is with those stupid sheep in the wilderness. And uh, um, you, have this, you have this very clear distinction between the innocence of David and the already offended spirit of Eliab. Uh, and, and by the way, so David's going to become king, right? He's going to run from Saul for years and years. He's going to become king. Eliab's never mentioned again. So he, so he gets the chance to join David. He gets the chance to support the cause of Christ. He's never mentioned again. It's a really good chance he never gets over this. He just... He just finishes his life in the bitterness that David was chosen and he wasn't. And, and this is a picture of the world. This is a picture of one after God's own heart. And somebody, God's calling you right now. I can hear it. So this continues here. And so in verse 31, wow, he's calling several of you. In verse 31... When the words that David spoke were heard, they were repeated before Saul. And so Saul sent for him, and David says to Saul. Now, he really does say this in innocence, but it is quite an indictment. He says, let no man's heart fail him because of Goliath. Now, who, whose heart has failed him because of Goliath? Saul's heart. Saul's the one who should be doing it. Remember when Saul was anointed as king? He was said of Saul, he was head and shoulders taller than anybody in Israel. Now he's not as big as Goliath, but he's the biggest guy they got. And Saul's already fought battles. He's already won. He says he's a man of war, but the difference is 
uh, courage and cowardice. Now, cowardice is, is altogether a different thing than being fearful. Like I said, there, there are heroes who have won the Congressional Medal of Honor who will tell you, I was scared the whole time. So it, it, cowardice is the action, not the emotion. When you choose to run away, when you choose to pay somebody else to go fight Goliath for you, when you try to manipulate others to do what you don't want to do, this is the, this is the world's way. And, and David's courage isn't even recognized by David. Because David's courage isn't in himself. David's courage is in the Lord. He's confident of what the Lord will do. Now, uh, we're not going to read all of this here, but there's this conversation that goes on. And it's pretty telling. It's a conversation between, it's the, it's the first conversation between David and Saul. And Saul is more than willing to send this guy out. Now, we, this is the passage where we know that David is a young man. Now, uh, when I was a boy growing up, a lot of times in Sunday school with flannel graphs. How many of you grew up with flannel graphs in Sunday school? Me too. Bless your hearts. That, nobody does that anymore. So, uh, when, so as growing up, uh, often in the flannel graph story, David is portrayed as being 12. He's portrayed as being 10. He's, he's not. He's not 10 or 11 or 12, but he is 16, 17. He's right in there. So he's not, uh, Saul's probably uh, 35, between 35 and 40 right here. Uh, so, so David's a, he's a young man, and um, Saul is a warrior, and they, they start this conversation. And so Saul's more than willing to send this shepherd boy out to get murdered by Goliath. I mean, in, humanly speaking, he's willing to do that. He even says, you know, well, have you got any armor or anything? No, he's a shepherd boy. I don't, he, doesn't have, he doesn't even have a sword. He goes, well, here, here, you can wear my stuff. Saul is head and shoulders bigger than any guy in Israel. David is still in his adolescent body. And so he puts it on. And then, you know, tries to walk in it, and he's smart enough to say, I, I can't wear these. I can't, I can't go in these. And this is where we learn something about David. So we're going to pause the story here for a second, because we learn something about David here, and that is, he is not new to giants, It appears he is, but he's actually had adversity before. He's actually had to fight before. And Saul says, how can you go and fight him? You're just a, you're just a teenager. He's been a warrior ever since he was a teenager. And David says, well, one time a lion came to take my lambs and I, I killed the lion and one time a bear came, and I took the bear. He literally says, grabbed him by the beard and smote him. Okay, let's just think that through for a little bit. Now, I don't think that the Middle Eastern bears were grizzlies. So let's just, let's just talk about an average normal black bear. What do you got? You got maybe a little knife you whittle with, and you got a sling and a stone. And I, I told my kids one time. I said, if I ever, if I ever find out that I've got like the kind of cancer that just can't be cured, I said, what I want to do is I'm just going to put bacon grease all over myself and go out in grizzly country with a knife. <laughs> and of course, my daughter went. Out. And my son looked at me and I said, oh, wouldn't that be a great way to go? <laughs> huh? But a knife and a bear and a... So here's something I want you to see. David is prepared, and that's in contrast to he's not experienced. 
See the, see the difference? He never fought a man before. He never fought a giant man before. But he was, he had been prepared by God for this moment. And so David is like, he's literally like, I don't know, I, he doesn't have claws. He doesn't have teeth. I, I, yeah, I think I can take him. It, the preparation that God's done in his heart. And, and, and by the way, this preparation has been done in anonymity. David's not known before this moment. David's not known to us until God says to Samuel, go to the house of Jesse and I'll tell you who to anoint. Eliab goes by, Shammah goes by, six other guys go by. Samuel has to say, you got any other sons? He goes, well, there's the youngest. Go get him. And when he shows up, God says, that's the one. So God's been preparing him. He's been, he's been singing songs, writing music. He's been writing poems. He's been fighting bears, fighting lions, keeping the sheep, pretty much by himself. And now he's thrust on the stage, but he's not thrust on the stage unprepared. God's been doing a work in his life. Well, here's how the battle goes. So um, David puts off Saul's stuff. He says, I can't go with those. Find verse 40. In verse 40, he took his staff. Uh, shepherd's staff is, you, you guys have seen these from Christmas plays, right? Uh, the, so shepherd has uh, two things. All shepherds have two things. They have a rod and a staff. Remember that your 23rd Psalm? Your rod and your staff, they come from me. So the staff is the thing that goes up higher than your head, frequently uh, 10 feet, got a hook on it. And what does the shepherd do with it? Well, he hooks sheep by the neck that are, when he's, that are wandering off. He's got it, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a gentle tool, and he's, he uses it as a walking stick, and he's walking along with it, but then when the sheep are there, he nudges them here, hooks them by the neck there, and he keeps them in control. The, the rod is entirely different. The rod is uh, this long, much shorter than a baseball bat, but made like a baseball bat. The rod is a, is a weapon. It's a, it's a billy club. That's what a rod is. Um, as, I read, uh, as I read about uh, one commentary, as he described how your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The, the, the staff is that gentle tool, but the rod not so much. And the writer said that in ancient times, the shepherd would have a little lamb. He would wander off. He'd bring him back. He'd wander off. He'd bring him back. He'd wander off. The lamb's life was in danger because he kept wandering off. So shepherd would take the lamb. He'd take him in his lap. He'd take the, he'd take the, the billy club, the rod. He'd break his leg on purpose. And then he'd set it, wrap it and set it. What did he have to do with that little lamb for a few days? Wear him. Round his neck, seen the picture of Jesus? Wear him around the neck. Pretty soon he could put him down. He'd be like, but he, he couldn't wander off. And when the leg healed, he didn't wander away anymore. I'd like to tell you that Jesus has always cared for me with his staff. But there have been a few in my life. Always out of love. This is what David has. David has one other thing. He's got his slingshot. So David took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the brook. That's down in the bottom there. And he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling went in his hand and he approaches the Philistine. Now, you all, I think you all know this, but let's just make it clear. It's not the, it's not the American slingshot. It's not the, it's not the fork with the thing. It's an it's a ancient slingshot. It's a, a rawhide down to a, a pouch that holds the rock with rawhide on the other side. And you, you swing it over your head, and you know when to let go of one of the pieces of rawhide. And as you let it go here, that rock snaps out. And you can, the, there's, the, there's the guys in South America, you can get really good with these. 
Guys, this, is, this was a weapon that you could get really good with. And, and they talk about, even like later we're going to read about David's mighty men of valor, they would have been able to use this slingshot right-handed or left-handed. It's just, just the ability of to do that. So he's walked down in there. Now, you, you guys know uh, Goliath is wearing armor, 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 spear, sword. He's ready for battle. Verse 41, the Philistine moved forward. He came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when David, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him because he was but a youth. Although it does say he was ruddy and handsome. That means he was redheaded. <laughs> Which is what I used to be. Not handsome, just redheaded. And the Philistine says to David, am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? He's got a staff in his hand. The staff isn't even the rod, it's the staff. It, what am I, a dog that you would come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, and you got a guy carrying all your stuff, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. And I'm going to give your dead bodies to the host of uh, the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts. He's using his own words that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. So, so here's a completely different motivation. This goes back to the faith of David. It's not. This isn't. This isn't my. This isn't my big break, where I'm going to get a chance to show everybody that I I deserve more than those few sheep in the wilderness. This is about his faith. He says in verse 47, not only all the earth will know, but at this assembly, why is it so important that this assembly, particularly the assembly behind David, know that the Lord saves not with the sword and the spear? Because those guys have been listening to Goliath for 81 times, and they've been afraid. So it's important that this assembly knows that the battle is the Lord's. I want you to see another comparison. I want you to see humility versus defiance. You know, um, I have to say that a lot of time, particularly, I ha particularly with young people, when they, when they don't want Jesus and they don't want the Lord, and uh, I, 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 I feel in many of them anger. Uh, I, I feel in them maybe the anger that uh, they weren't loved when they were kids, maybe abused, maybe discarded. The, the parents are divorced and the parents are divorced again and divorced again. And some of them, they're not even living. I've, I've talked to kids and they, they, they're, the adults in their life, there were so many divorces. They were three divorces removed from biological parents. They're just getting passed around just angry at the world, and it builds a, builds a defiance, and nothing wrong with a little self-determination, but anger and hostility, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Humility of David, David doesn't sound humble here, but, but I want you to understand what it is. I want you to know that humility and confidence are not opposites. They're not opposites. He, he's confident, but he's not arrogant. Why? Where does his confidence come from? The battle is the Lord's. The Lord doesn't need a sword. The Lord doesn't need a spear. The Lord doesn't need a horse. The Lord doesn't need a shield. The battle is the Lord's. The Lord doesn't even need me, but since nobody else stepped up today, I want not only you to know, but I want this assembly to know, these guys behind me, that the battle is the Lord's. And uh, here's how it goes. So when, verse 48, when the Philistine arose 
and he came and drew near to meet David. David ran at him. He ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. Here's the difference. This person, this person runs to the battle. And this person waits or even procrastinates. Uh, you guys familiar with uh, the charity uh, uh, Tunnels to Towers? It's a, it's a charity that started out of the 9-11 experience when some guys were off shift and they just got off shift and they were going, and I'm not familiar with uh, New York City, but they were going away from uh, the Long Island down there and they'd gone through a certain particular tunnel when they heard of what happened and they turned around. They didn't have to. They weren't on duty. They turned around and they went back. And they went into those buildings to save as many people as possible. You know, they, they, they say, well, how do you know if you're a fireman or not? The answer is, when somebody says fire, do you run at the fire or away from the fire? If you run at it, you're a fireman. Well, God calls us to do this work. And yes, there's fire. And yes, there's the gates of hell. But the gates of hell don't prevail against us. And the, the, the one who has a heart for God runs to the battle. Uh, I can't even tell you over the years how many people, as I met them and I talked to them about them giving their lives to the Lord, or the, as they gave their lives to the Lord, they would say to me, they'd have a friend right there next to them, and they'd say, this is my friend, and I'll just make up a name, Sally. And when everybody else left me, Sally stood by me. When no one else would take my calls, Sally was there. When I picked up the phone and said, I'm in big trouble, she said, where are you at? I'll come and get you. That's, that's running to the battle. That's, that's going into the fray. And, and by the way, when you do that, do you come out unscathed? No, you don't. Sometimes you get some of the wounds of battle. Sometimes it's tough. But this is who David is. He's a guy that runs to the battle. Well, you know how this is. I won't read this part. He takes that slingshot. He's running right at him and then lets it go. There's some part between the helmet and whatever else that, that Goliath had right between the eyes. Down he goes. There's a great discussion about was he dead then or dead when David cut off his head. My answer is, I'm not sure if he was dead the first time. I'm pretty sure he was dead by the second time. <laughs> David gets there. David doesn't have a sword. He takes Goliath's sword. When he, sorry, ladies, guys, when he holds up his head, all the guys on the mountain behind him, right? So it's a Braveheart moment kind of thing, right? So here's a couple more things. David is godly compared to Goliath, who everybody thought was the goat. Do you guys know the new terminology in sports? The goat. When we were kids growing up, if you were the goat, that was a bad thing. Now it's been flipped on its head. It stands for, in sports life, greatest of all time. First, really, first use of Tom Brady. Greatest of all time, the goat. So the world's looking for the goat. God's looking for the godly. So it's, it's David the godly, Goliath the goat. What happens in that moment? Well, the, the one after God's own heart, he inspires others. What has Goliath been doing for 40 days? He discourages others. Just different people, different paradigms. Look at this person. They're fearful, they're defensive, they're cowardly. They may be experienced, but they're not prepared. They're defiant, they wait, they procrastinate. They sure want a great reputation, but they are discouraging to others. That's not a person after God's own heart. So when David does this, when he lifts up Goliath's head, they all join the battle. And the Philistines go, and they turn and run. 
And they killed the Philistines all the way back to Gath. And here's kind of the end of the story. Verse 55. So as soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, and I don't think this means the moment that he's walking out there. It may be that moment, but it's probably afterwards. As soon as he saw him go out against the Philistine, he says to Abner, and Abner's his general. It's a conversation between two guys. One of those guys should have been out there. Saul should have been out there. Abner should have been out there. Neither of them were there. And he says to Abner, whose son is this? And Abner says, as your soul lives, I don't know. They're standing there, the two guys, two warriors. These are, these are warriors. They're standing there, they're watching this boy go into the valley, and he goes, who is that? And Abner goes, ah, for the life of me, I don't know. He sees, now David will never be anonymous again, by the way, after this day. But this moment, they still don't know who he is. God does not mind at all using unknown people. The world, they want famous people. You know, the world, they're, the world are, they're name droppers. Who is this kid? I don't know. But after this day, everybody knows. So, I... I want to be a man after God's own heart. I don't know what God has for me today. I don't know what he has for me tomorrow. But I, I do, I have lived just long enough to know that God just doesn't let you coast. He loves you too much. He, he wants to grow your faith. He wants to grow your love of him. And so there are times when he brings a giant problem into your life. There's times when you have adversity. It doesn't have to be a nine foot six guy in armor. It can be cancer. It could be the cancer of a loved one. It can be a layoff. It can be a relationship that you just can't quite say the right thing and you're not, you just, you're not doing well with it. It can be Money problems, it can be health problems, it can be any of this, but God brings it into your life. And it's a good litmus test to see where you fall. Which one are you? Are you, are you this list? And that's a, honestly, that's a pretty ugly list. But sometimes you just coast into that. And you get cowardly and defensive and defiant and you get angry at the world and you, you just not, you're not taking life on. Or you, look at this list. Faithful and innocent and courageous and prepared. And, and let me say this about adversity. You guys know this. Hey, this. This room's old enough to know this. When it comes to adversity, you're either in it, just came out of it, or going into it. That's the only three spots that there are. You, you're, you're, either, you're either getting ready to go in it, you are in it, or you're just coming out of it. And honestly, there might only be two spots because when you're just coming out of it, you're getting ready to go in it. That, that's all there is for adversity. And when, when I hit seasons of my life that are kind of smooth, oh, I'm old enough now I double down with prayer and fast and thank God because I know what's happening. He's preparing me. He's giving me a little time to get ready because I, I, we're going to go into it again. This world's broken and it's hard. There's going to be confrontation and difficulty. Your faith is going to be tested. That's not the end of the world. That's what God does. He brings giants into your life so that he can make you to look like him. So let's just figure this, let's just do this last. A heart after God's means this is what God's heart looks like. As New Testament believers, we know I want to look like Jesus. I would suggest to you this is what Jesus looks like. He's faithful and innocent, and in his case, completely. Courageous and prepared, humble, 
Did he ever turn around and walk away from the cross? Uh-uh. Set his, set his face to Jerusalem, to the cross. Godly, inspires others. And until he went to the cross, unknown. He never, he, he never was ever farther than 100 miles away from his birthplace. Never wrote a book. He never did a TV interview. And he changes our life. I want to look like Jesus. I want to look like David. So now we're going to study David. And, and what we're going to study next is a horrible period of time in David's life. What's going to happen next is that Saul is going to get so jealous of David's popularity, he's going to try to kill David for the next 10 years. David's going to live in caves. He's going to, he's going to live like an outlaw. He's going to have to leave Israel. He's going to go live with the Philistines for a while, and he's going to have to pretend like he's mentally ill because they remember who he is. It's going to be really, really tough. And you're going to want to come because this is when he writes some of his psalms. And we're going to read this together, and this is the study that we're going to do.